last class we ended the discussion with the current liabilities in a balance sheet and to be more specific uh, it was on the issue of deferred revenues that I ended the class. There was a question to further elaborate on what deferred revenue is with a good example. Let us say I am, I am a, a magazine subscription company. So, the entity that we are talking about is a magazine subscription company and that I have collected cash, I have collected money with a promise that I am going to for the next 12 months provide you with the monthly issues of the magazine. Now, from the entity's perspective, from the subscription company's perspective, the balance sheet would show the amount that I have collected as a deferred revenue. On one hand on the assets, it would have recorded the cash that I have received for this and on the other hand I would record because the principle of duality, the other entry corresponding to this cash should be the deferred revenue and why is this a current liability? Because this represents the liability that arises from the fact that as an entity I have received money, I am bound to provide these magazines every month for the next one year. Now, what happens when I start doing this? Let us say the first month I deliver the first issue. So, one twelfth of the money that I received will be recognized as a sale. So, at that point of time, one twelfth of the amount would be recognized as sales and I would not add cash because I have already received this money. So, that one twelfth would be reduced from the deferred revenue liability. So, that would be the corresponding second entry one month later after I have supplied this magazine. We will talk about this more when we are talking on concepts like recognizing and realizing revenues. But for the purpose of understanding why deferred revenue is a liability, this is a very good example so that you will appreciate that this represents a liability of an entity to provide a service for which it has already received an advance payment. Now, getting a little further, just as we have current assets and fixed assets, we have current liabilities and long term liabilities. Long term liabilities are predominantly long term debt or the company's own bonds that they issue. So, which means I borrow money from the bank, repayment period is 8 years, 10 years. Since it is long term, this stands as a long term debt or raise money by selling corporate bonds the period, the duration of the bonds 5 years, 10 years, whatever the case may be, these are long term debts. And I already told you that the fundamental equation is assets is equal to liabilities plus owners equity. We have seen what assets categories are, what liability categories are. Now, let us see what the owners equity categories are. What is owners equity? Now, owner's equity is the extent to which an owner's investment in an entity is expressed. Usually, we, we see that this gets reflected from the fact that you know a, a owner or a group of owners owns certain percentage of shares in the incorporated entity. So, the extent to which he owns the shares determines the extent to which he owns the entity. So, that is why you often see that this owner's equity terminology itself can is substituted with this terminology called shareholders equity, the extent to which I own the shares of a particular firm. 
So, the shareholders equity has two parts in it. The first part is the paid in capital and the second part is the retained earnings. Now, what is paid in capital? The paid in capital part of the shareholders equity is the amount that the owners have directly contributed in creating this entity. So, this is the amount that they have directly invested in the business. The extent to which their contribution is represented in the direct investment that is being made is the extent to which they own this entity. Now, again this paid in capital which is the direct investment, direct owner investment has two parts. the capital stock and additional paid in capital. What is the difference? I told you before that you know shares are issued by companies and the extent to which somebody owns a share determines the extent to which he or she owns the entity. Let us say that an entity has 1 million shares outstanding. And when we talk about share, every share has a par value, the value that appears on the share certificate. Let us say this 1 million shares that is outstanding has a par value of rupee 1. And as investors, investors paid rupees 5 to own one share, does it make sense? Can you appreciate the difference between capital stock and additional paid in capital? The share that is sold to an investor for rupees 5 has a capital stock component which is represented by its par value of rupees 1 and an additional paid in component which is the differential of rupees 4. And since we have 1 million shares outstanding, how was this expressed? So, your paid in capital gets modified, paid in capital is now represented, this is for the entire 1 million shares. So, it is usually represented in your balance sheet, if you look it will say common stock at par, that is your 1 million and additional paid in capital your additional paid in capital is your 4 million so your total paid in capital is 5 million So, this excess over par is your additional paid in capital. Now, your shareholders equity as I told you before has two components your paid in capital and your retained earnings and we just saw what paid in capital is. Then what is retained earnings? Now, retained earnings is the second category of shareholders equity. See the owner's equity in a business increases if the earnings of the business increases. 
what do I mean by earnings of the business? I make a sale, there is income, there is a lot of expenses associated with the sale that I made. So, after meeting all those expenses, taxes, I have some net income that is available to the owner, which means after meeting all the expense related items, there is a free income that is available to the owner and let us say this is the earnings that is available to the owner. So, the owner's equity gets increased because of this increased in earnings. Now, suppose from the earnings the board decides to disburse dividends, which means it goes to the shareholders also. The principal owner's equity gets reduced because of this disburse, disbursal of dividends, otherwise the earnings would have entirely come to me or to the firm. Now, it is disbursed as dividends and after dividends whatever is the remaining part of the earnings that is available gets into the firm as retained earnings. So, retained earnings can be expressed as the total earnings minus the total dividends disbursed. When? Because in your balance sheet, the retained earnings will be one number. It is the difference between the total earnings of the entity from the time of its inception to the balance sheet date and the total amount paid as dividends out of the earnings right from the time of its inception up to the balance sheet date. That is the retained earnings component or to put it in a better perspective for you to understand, it is that earnings that gets reinvested into the business. The money after even the dividends are distributed that gets retained by the business for its own internal investments is your retained earnings. But a caution here is that you should not confuse retained earnings with cash. Retained earnings is not equal to cash. You look at the sample balance sheet, you will find that retained earnings is an amount while cash is a different amount. Now, what is retained earnings? It is the aggregate of all the earnings from the time of inception up to the balance sheet date minus all the dividends dispersed during this period. And what is cash? Cash is the ending cash as on that particular date. Both will not be equal, very often people misunderstand cash with retained earnings, just as they also misunderstand income with cash. I will explain that there is also a difference between income and cash when we actually talk about income statement, but retained earnings is not cash. Now, why is this part of shareholders equity? Retained earnings is part of shareholders equity because the earnings that the entity earns after it has met all the liabilities, whose the principal beneficiary of this earnings? It is the shareholder, but I the shareholder decided that I am not going to take the money for me, but I am going to reinvest into the business retain it for the purpose of business investment, I call it as a retained earnings and it is a money that a shareholder decided that I do not need it now, but would rather invest in the business and hence it is the shareholders money that just got into the business as retained earnings, it is part of shareholders equity. So, it is not just the paid in capital or the direct investment in capital that alone represents shareholders equity it is also the extent to which the shareholder has continuously contributed by way of retained earnings over a period of time that also represents the shareholders equity.
Now, I can understand this if my business is incorporated, because I have share, I have stocks, the extent to which I own the share determines the extent to which I own the business, but that does not mean for unincorporated business there is no shareholder equity or I am not able to express shareholders equity. For unincorporated business namely a proprietorship firm or a partnership firm, still you can express the capital portion, let us say in a partnership. A partnership is an unincorporated business, it is owned jointly by several persons. Now, let us say there are two people who own this business and the total capital in the business is 30,000. So, x excess capital let us say they are equal partners 50,000, y is capital 15,000, total partners equity 30,000. Partners equity will also increase or decrease based on his or her share of the entity's earnings during that period. Let us say X capital beginning was 80,000, and uh, the entity the entity's earnings from from the entity's earnings the portion that x should get is 35000 add excess earnings and the partner also had some drawings during this period so partners or excess drawing anything within parenthesis means it is minus. So, what is this 91,000? It is excess capital as on a particular date that we are studying now. So, the capital part, the equity part can also be expressed even for unincorporated entities. Now, let us see whether with this input we can still expand our fundamental equation, which is assets is equal to liabilities plus now your owner's equity gets split into two parts paid in capital plus retained earnings. Now, with this definition <coughs> and the five concepts that we saw earlier, you can begin to appreciate changes that can happen in a balance sheet based on events that occur, the numbers keep changing in the balance sheet that we start creating. And as and when an accountant records these events it gets meticulously recorded and then the changes get reflected in the balance sheet. And at each stage since balance sheet is a status report, each stage of the balance sheet reports the financial condition of the entity on that particular date it was prepared. It is a practice that a balance sheet is prepared at specific intervals. But for the purpose of appreciating these accounting concepts, I would just try to record some entries and create mini balance sheets, so that you will appreciate 
how these rec entries are being recorded at a balance sheet level and how a balance sheet at the end, end of the day balances. Just for the sake of appreciation, let, let us just quickly work some examples, quick examples of the effect of a few transactions on the balance sheet of an entity, a firm. I will just give you a few examples. Now, let us say a person is going to start a music store, okay. it is a, it's a firm, the entity is a music store. Now, he starts this business by depositing 25,000 rupees of his own money and he puts this money into the business and in return he just gets some stock certificates worth 25,000 that, that says that this person is the owner of the business. So, let us say I, I name this music store as let us say music mart. So, that is the name of the entity, this is how a balance sheet is prepared. Then what type of a financial statement are we discussing? We are talking about a balance sheet. And let us say it is on January 1st that I put 25,000 of my money to start the business. So, January 1, 2012, I started this business. So, this is a balance sheet. Now, assume that this is the only entry. Can I have a balance sheet? Yes, I can have. The balance sheet will look simple that is all, but still it is a balance sheet. So, how simple will that balance sheet look? It will be as simple as this. Assets, the firm got cash, how much? 25,000. Why did I say assets cash 25,000? Because the firm received 25,000 from the owner. So, cash 25,000. What is the resource and claim view of a balance sheet? If you have an asset of 25,000, then there must be a corresponding liability item which has a claim against this asset. Now, in this case, who has a claim against this asset of 25,000? It is the owner. So, where will I record this? Under the liability the owner's equity section paid in capital. Paid in capital 25,000. Is this a balance sheet? Yes, it is a balance sheet. Why is it a balance sheet? Because it represents assets and liabilities of the entity and 25,000 is the asset, 25,000 is the liability it is a balance sheet, it is the most simplest form of a balance sheet. Now, suppose after some time that the firm decides to borrow some money from a bank and uh, let us say the amount that I borrow is around 12,500. Now, what happens when I borrow money from the bank? What is the effect on the balance sheet? Now, the first, the first entity, the first balance sheet that we created was the, during the creation of the firm. Now, the second one is the bank loan. The music mart balance sheet remains the same except that the date changes. So, assume that before January, let us say I did this on January 10. So, you will have balance sheet, you will have music mark here, assets, cash. Now, I borrowed 12,500, which means 
the cash that I have now will be 37,500. Now, on this side liabilities plus owners equity, what will be the corresponding entry? One thing that has not changed is my paid in capital, right? Twenty five thousand. Now, the fact that I owe the bank twelve thousand five hundred has to be recorded as a liability. So, I say loans payable twelve thousand five hundred. So, total thirty seven thousand five hundred. equals. So, what is the balance sheet of this firm as on January 10, 2012? This is the balance sheet of the firm, a simple balance sheet except that the first 10 days we had only 2 transactions, but still it qualifies to be a balance sheet. Now, suppose I start a business, I purchase some inventory worth rupees 5000. And how did I purchase the inventory? There are two ways I could have done it. I purchase the inventory worth 5000 and say that I am going to pay this 5000 later, or I purchase this inventory 5000 and said, okay, I pay 5000 right away. Let us assume that I did the second option. So, I purchase inventory and paid 5000 rupees. And when did I do this? Let us say I did this on January 15. So, balance sheet 15 1. 2012. So, what will happen to my assets? There will be two entries now. What will be the two entries? One is that I have paid 5000 rupees. Now, where did I pay it from? Because I already have a cash of 5000. So, my cash gets reduced by 5000. Now, what is the principle of duality? There should be a dual impact. Where is the second impact? Because I paid this cash, I got inventory worth 5000. Now, has this transaction altered my liabilities plus owners equity? No. My loans payable paid in capital remains unaltered. as a result of which the total is 37500 here also 37500 i said i can do this transaction in two ways except that i chose to pay it now had i chose chosen to pay this a little later the balance sheet would have been assets 37500 my liability would have also increased because I have not paid this inventory. So, what would have happened to the balance sheet? Balance sheet amount would have been just I just want to spend a little time here. Suppose at this stage, this is where I purchase the inventory. I said I purchase the inventory because I paid I removed 5000 from cash here. But if I have not done that and I said I am going to pay it later, this 37500 would have remained there. I would have added inventory. So, 37500 plus 5000 would have been 42500. The dual impact, the second impact would have been on the liability side where I would have added one more entry called accounts payable 5000 as a result of which this total would have, be, would have changed to 42500. Now, that also is a balance sheet, that also is a correct balance sheet for the same firm, except that the way in which I transacted differed. Now, let us say for I begin I have begun selling 
So, I sold something let us say for 750 rupees. I sold some merchandise that was costing only 500 rupees. Now, what will happen? This gets a little interesting. I sold merchandise costing 500 for 750 rupees. This is the transaction. How do I record this? Cash increases because I sold something and in return I got cash. Now, how much did I sell it for? I sold it for 750 rupees. So, what would be the total cash? It will be 33,250. What would be the value of the inventory now? I did not sell an item from thin air, I, I consumed some inventory. What is the value of the inventory that I consumed? It is 500. So, from that 5000 that was existing before I sold 500 worth merchandise. So, what will be the total here? So, this is on the asset side. Now, how do we record this in the liabilities and owners equity? As a fact that I have sold inventory worth 500 for 750 rupees changed by equation with the bank? No, because I still owe the bank. So, my loans payable does not change. My paid in capital also does not change. What is the paid in capital? It remains as 25,000. So, where do we accommodate this difference? Here it is 37,500, here it is 37,750. Where do I accommodate this difference of 250? It gets into the retained earnings component. Why? Because this 250 is the profit of the sale and this entirely belongs, assume that there is as on date there is no other liability it entirely belongs to the <coughs> owner's equity. So, the owner's equity has to increase by 250 and which part of the owner's equity increases by 250 not the capital because it did not go into the capital. It is the retained earnings part that got increased by 250. Remember I told you before that retained earnings is not cash look at this balance sheet, you have a cash of 33,250, you have a retain earnings of 250 only, means that retain earnings is not equal to cash. Now, at this point if you are not able to understand some of the concepts, there is no reason to get alarmed because in the subsequent sections we are going to considerably expand on some of the concepts, some of the categorizations that I have made and we will describe in detail how the behavior of these account categories change under different contexts. But it is essential that you understand that the fundamental equation that always remains uncompromised is that assets is equal to liabilities plus your retained earnings and that when you record these transactions that you will be following a set of concepts 
only five concepts that we have already covered. Quick recap of them, the money measurement concept that says that all accounting transactions need to be monetized. The entity concept that says that the individual is different from the firm. The going concern which assumes that the entity exists forever. The cost concept which says that the asset is recorded at the cost of its acquisition and the dual aspect which says that every transaction affects at least two items and preserves the fundamental equation liability plus owner's equity is equal to assets. And that we also saw what a balance sheet is all about. Now, what we will be doing in the next class is to also understand what income statement is and what the remaining six concepts based on which the accounting principles are being framed. Now, before I go that you should understand how an income statement is different from a balance sheet. See the, the entity for which we are creating this financial statement, I said can be expressed in two ways. One if you look at the balance sheet, it gives you a status report. So, that tells you the financial strength at a given point of time and hence it is called a status report or a stock report. As against an income statement which I said in the previous class is a flow report which measures the flow over a period of time. For people who understand physics or engineering, you know you it is difficult to predict the position as well as velocity at the same point of time. So, either I look at the balance sheet and understand the financial position at that point of time or look at the income statement to understand the performance over a period of time. So, an income statement is not a snapshot, a balance sheet is not a motion picture, a balance sheet is a snapshot and an income statement is a motion picture. Now, what is that in an income statement that we are trying to cover? Some continuous flow, what is that continuous flow? In a business cycle, any business cycle if you look at it. any business cycle will have cash, and with cash what will you do? You purchase, you purchase inventory or you manufacture goods as a result of which you have some inventory. And what do you do with the inventory? You engage in some earning activities. That results in sales and accounts receivables as well. How does our account receivable get converted to cash? Because you have some collection activities. So, you get cash by sales or accounts receivable converted to cash because of collection activities. Then you use the cash to purchase inventories and when you purchase inventories you manufacture goods and then you have finished good inventory that needs to be sold. And the time between selling the inventory again collecting cash or reaching the accounts receivable period you engage in earning activities which actually converts the finished good inventory into sale. Now, we are interested in seeing the behavior of these earning activities from finished good that is being sold, what price it is sold, what is the charge that is apportioned to the revenue that is generated, what is the expense against the revenue that is being generated, is the sale being made profitable. So, between this period of inventory to cash at sale or accounts receivable for later being collected as cash is your earning activities and an income statement focuses 
on earning activities and the related expenses associated with these earning activities, which means for an identified revenue you will have identified set of expenses and if you are able to record both these, then you can say that this is the net income and so on. So, an income statement is based on focusing these earning activities, but then the question is how do we know whether if we have made a sale or not. Another question is I know I have made a sale, but I do not know whether I can I can I will collect the entire amount or I will just receive some amount. Another question is I have made sales there is a revenue, but I do not know what portion of the expense can be apportioned to this particular revenue. So, questions get a little complicated how do I recognize sale first, how do I realize sale the extent to which a sale is made and how is that I am able to match corresponding expenses with corresponding revenue. For that you need to understand the other six principles of accounting out of which the first three is related to what I was talking now recognition, realization and matching expenses to revenues and then other three standard accounting concepts, which I will be explaining in next class. The remaining six concepts based on which the accounting principles are evolved. So, at the end of this class, I am sure you would have understood those five concepts and the balance sheet of an entity and what a balance sheet conveys. Looking at the balance sheet, you can see how financially well off is a particular firm. Next class, I will give you introduction to an income statement and we will also be covering the remaining six accounting concepts and then when you begin to look at both the balance sheet and income statement together with these accounting concepts forming the background, then you will begin to appreciate that a balance sheet and an income statement so finely interwoven gives more information about the firm than each of them looked independently. After which we actually would be getting into the real double entry bookkeeping concepts, the concepts of debit, credit, how do we identify, measure and communicate these transactions in a form that is universally understood in the same way. So, that we will be covering in the subsequent classes. So, next class be prepared to understand what an income statement is and what the six remaining principles talk about. And as I had assured you, I will also bring during my next class the sample balance sheet and income statement that I will also put it as part of this lecture, so that you can revisit the sample balance sheet and income statement when you actually go through these lecture notes. So, thank you very much, I will see you next class.